Hello, my friends. I am Katie Taylor. I am a certified child life specialist and the host of Child Life on Call. I'm so happy to have you with us this week. We will be talking to Julie. She is a child life specialist who has spent 18 years with the same unit, the same population, and has seen the growth that has come not only in the child life field, but within the medical field and kidney disease. And she has watched her tiniest patients who were born with end-stage renal disease go on to graduate, go to college, and accomplish so many things, which she tells me is her favorite part of the job. As a child life specialist who bebopped around the hospital and didn't stay in one place too, for too long, I was in the NICU, I was in the ER, I was in radiology, I was in med surge, I was in hemonc, I was all over the place. So it's so interesting for me, somebody who went all over the place, to talk to, to someone who has been in the same unit for 18 years. And just the wealth of information and knowledge she has for these families is truly life-changing. So If you have ever been interested in what a long career in child life might sound like in the same unit, then definitely take a listen to this episode. But you'll also hear on some of the more out of the norm child life ways that she does interventions with families and from the very beginning of their journey and coming in for transplant. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here today. Happy Child Life Month, my friends. I am so happy and excited to be with you. It is the first week of Child Life Month, which is the month of March. And traditionally, if you're a child life specialist, we spend the whole month making sure that others know what our job is. But here at Child Life on Call, we want you to know how grateful we are that you show up to work every day. Parents, that you ask questions with this Child Life community, that you find benefits from the tips and suggestions that we put out there on social media. So this is just a big hug from me here at Child Life on Call to you to say happy Child Life Month. And we wanted to give back to all of you who listen to the Child Life on Call podcast. We know your child life specialists, parents, and child life students. So I'm so excited to tell you that if you are a child life specialist who has been wanting to join the child life circle, you have been wanting to find a place online where you can connect with other child life specialists, get PDUs that are not crazy expensive, get access to virtual clinical supervision. You can do all of that for just $19.99 a month. I know it sounds very inexpensive, too good to be true, but I promise it is not. In actually just during the month of March, sign up with no strings attached for free for seven days. Come try out the circle, see what you think. We would love to meet you there. Parents, we haven't forgot about you either. Last year, we launched our How to Prepare, Support, and Respond to Your Child During Shots course. The feedback we got from parents was incredible. They felt empowered. They initially had tools as soon as they left the course to go support their child and advocate for them. And we want you to have that course. We are having it available during the month of March for 50% off. So if you go to childlifeoncall.com slash shots, and when you type in the coupon code March, 50% off, no questions asked, but make sure you get it because this deal and this course will not last forever. And lastly, Child Life students, if you're listening, we have partnered with some of the best mentors in the field, your Child Life coach, your Child Life guide, AJ and Lauren. And if you come get a Child Life student service through us and you type in the coupon code March, then you get 10% off any of your services this month. So come join us. We would love to have you there. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Child Life on Call. This podcast is a safe place for parents to share their stories about what it's like to have a child that has a medical experience, diagnosis, disease, and or everything in between. We know there's power in sharing stories and that power multiplies when you can listen to other parents who have walked a similar path to yours. Giving and getting advice is great, but hearing how another parent navigates the complexities and nuances of healthcare is even better. As a child life specialist, my role is to support, validate, and provide emotionally safe spaces for kids and their families, and I am so honored to be on this journey with you. In addition to parent stories, we sprinkle in some expert episodes every now and again that have content for both parents and professionals in the field of healthcare, all with the mission to empower parents to be confident advocates and partners with the care team during healthcare experiences. We're so glad you're here. I'm Julie Gillian. I'm a certified child life specialist at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. 
Um, I'm in the renal service and I've been here 18 years, um, which seems like a long time and not a long time at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I love working with the renal population. I'm primarily with renal transplant and the renal outpatient clinic, um, but also cross cover within dialysis. So I've mm-hmm. worked in all the renal areas. And how amazing to be, first of all, in medicine for 18 years and to be at one place and really just see so many transitions, not only like within our field, but alongside medicine and how families receive treatment. I bet it's been pretty incredible. It definitely has been. Um, From the time I've started uh, to where we all are now, just the advancements in transplant, um, how long transplants are lasting, the medicines they use. It's been amazing to see um, just the growth as well. Um, We actually just opened up a brand new dialysis unit um, at our hospital. And so watching that come to fruition, from having been a dream of the department for so long to it actually happening um, yeah. has been amazing. So have you been in renal, uh, in the renal unit and with the kidney population all 18 years? I have been. Wow. How special. Do you yes. feel like you're an expert <laughs> on all things <laughs> kidneys? Um to hear someone say that honestly still sounds just kind of a little overwhelming. Um, I feel at times, yes, I have learned so much, um, Mm -hmm. but there is still so much more to learn as well. Yeah. Um, I can imagine. So Lindsay gave us, gave me permission for me to mention how I got introduced to you. Um, And so we have recorded stories together before, but she'll be on the podcast um, after yours. But she and her family went to Texas Children's for a kidney transplant. And she just mentioned how important and impactful what you did for her. And she was like, is it okay if I ask her to be on the podcast? I really want to hear more about her work and what she does and how she helps families. So you are making such an impact for families. And I cannot wait to to just kind of dive into what you know and how you support families. So will you kind of walk us through what supporting families in, do you mostly do transplants? Do you work in dialysis? Do you do all of it? Or or how do you support these families? A little bit of all of it. I'm not primarily in dialysis anymore because we were fortunate enough several years back to add a third position. When I started, there was two child life positions and we added a third. Um, So I'm primarily in clinic and um, transplant, but still have some dialysis here and there and cross cover. So a little bit all over. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things you wrote to me when we were um, corresponding before the the interview is you said that kidney and renal disease is often one of those kind of invisible diseases where Mm -hmm. on the outside, kids don't really look sick until they're really, really sick. And so it can be hard for families to number one, process the diagnosis, but also really benefit from the support of, you know, we can benefit from the support of neighbors and community members who maybe don't know or think their child is that sick. So true. Um, It really is one of those illnesses, those diseases that a lot of our kids, especially if they're diagnosed a little bit later, they're not going to look any different than any other kids. And so within peers, within the school system, um, I have talked to schools before and had teachers go, well, they don't look sick. Hmm. Why, why are they missing school? Um, we're now fortunate enough to have a school coordinator that works with schools to really help us and help our families um, get the support they need in the education system. Because once again, they often, schools will say, the kids don't look sick. I'm sure they're fine. Um, wow. So yeah, it is one of those illnesses that, it is hard to explain to others when a child doesn't look different than their peers, that they have so much going on and so much that can land them in the hospital for extended periods of time or frequent hospitalizations. Hmm. Talk about some of the intensity of having a child with chronic kidney disease and the wear and tear that it has on families. Um, I think a little bit that intensity is just the 
synchronicity of it in that it doesn't necessarily go away. With end-stage renal disease, there isn't a cure for it. Um, You are either on dialysis or you get a transplant, but transplant's another treatment option because Mm. transplants don't last forever. The life expectancy is getting longer and longer, Um, but oftentimes our kids that get a kidney transplant will have more than one in their lifetime. Um, And even with transplantation, they still need to come get labs. They still have doctor's visits. Um, They're still taking medicine at least twice a day um, to keep their kidney healthy and alive. So it's one of those things with families. A lot of people don't realize how much goes in and that it doesn't end. Um, There was a quote, a study um, about health-related quality of life and comparing the health-related quality of life amongst um, diagnoses. And patients and parents um, of end-stage, with end-stage renal disease or kidney disease, um, their health-related quality of life was the same as newly diagnosed cancer patients that were undergoing chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Wow. So it is definitely um, an illness that involves the whole family and can be pretty intense. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's really poignant because anyone can kind of imagine what it might be like for those families who are initially affected with cancer, right? Because we either have someone in our family who has had a cancer, or you know someone really, one really well, or maybe you've read about them or they've happened in your community, whereas end-stage renal disease is that invisible disease that often we're not talking about and we're not knowing if a kid in class has end-stage renal disease um, really as a community. But if somebody's going for, through cancer, it's recognizable because all of the external factors that change. So that is really puts into perspective what it's like for families. What are some of the um, more favorite child life interventions you do? And maybe we can start kind of from the front and get kind of nerdy. But like if you're um, like nerdy in like the child life world, like so if you're going in to make an assessment about a family that maybe you do or don't know, um, but they're coming in to see you for maybe transplant. I'm sure that happens a lot since, you know, Like in Lindsay's example, they traveled to go have a transplant at Texas Children's. What is in your assessment process when you meet those families? So for many of these families, the first time I'm meeting them is during the transplant evaluation. Um, Whether they're coming from afar like um, Lindsay and her family did, or even if are in our um, own clinic, um, a lot of the times I don't know these patients until the evaluation process. Uh, thankfully, we have a part in that evaluation that we're actually scheduled to meet with the family just as the social worker, the dietitian, um, the surgeons, we are part of their scheduled transplant evaluation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my evaluation with them, um, my assessment is a bit of rapport building, just getting mm-hmm. to know them, um, getting them comfortable with me. Um, If the kids are a little older, school age or so, or older, um, I start the process with letting them know a lot of people are talking to them. My questions today are mainly for them, the patient, and how we can best help them through this journey. Uh, So a lot of what I ask and look for is some is development to see where they are developmentally along the path, see if they have any accommodations in school already. Um, Do they seem to answer kind of on target level or not? And then a lot of my assessment is a coping assessment or an experience assessment. Um, How familiar are they with the hospital? Are they familiar at all with our hospital? We may be brand new to them. Um, So it kind of gives me a hint that maybe I need to do a tour with them and show them around a little bit more. What are the coping strategies they already utilize, whether it be for the medical environment with procedures? And then I also ask them what they do to relieve stress at home. If it's nothing medical involved or, you know, multiple tests during a school week, uh, how do they cope with that stress? And just trying to find out what will help them best to so therefore kind of lay a plan. And as I let them know, share that with the rest of the team too, so that we're all on the same page and know how to best help them. 
And then also just assessing their knowledge a bit of what do they know about transplants so far? What have they heard? And then kind of filling in some of those gaps appropriately of what the experience is going to be like for them. Wow. I can tell you're such a valuable part of the care team. Number one, that you have a spot in kind of that initial intake process for families. And number two, the information you're giving to the care team after you get to meet with these families, I'm sure they're like, oh, thank you. You know, we just don't have time to ask these questions or learn these things, but they're essential to compliance, adherence, um, right? Like positive coping, all of these things that make such a difference for families. How about for the younger kids? And I just think, I think about James and Lindsay, right? Because he is a toddler just coming in. Um, Oh my gosh, what has been fun. And you mentioned this when you wrote is for me to see just as a friend of the family, how much he has changed and grown and developed since transplant. And that, that initial phase, you're meeting them typically when they're really sick, they're really scared. And now James is walking, he's saying, mama, he's doing all these amazing things. Um, What is that transition like as you support families? Um, It's honestly one of my favorite transitions. I absolutely love to see when that happens. Um, James recently had a clinic visit. And so I got to see him walking around and talking. And it's so fun. And in that initial meeting of the families, a lot of the times I am just talking with the the parents because whether it's an infant or a toddler, the evaluation days are long days. So there are times when they're sleeping through my evaluation, which, of course, is perfectly fine. Right. Um, And so I'm just talking with the family to find out, you know, how can we best support you? How can we best support your child? Um, For James, it was learning pretty early on that Bluey is one of his favorites. And so (laughs) making sure I had some Bluey items when (laughs) he was admitted for transplant and reminding the family that and running the team actually that that's a favorite. So yeah, on his good side, mention Bluey. (laughs) Yeah. Good over Mickey Mouse. There's a new kid in town. It's Bluey now. (laughs) Oh gosh. It's, um, those little moments and the thought and care that you put in for families is just amazing. Um, it's so cool. And just hearing it from like, Ooh, I'm going to get tearful because hearing it from Lindsay's perspective and having them go through it, it's, it's hard to be a child life specialist for a lot of reasons, but like what you're describing right now, like the moments, um, that you get to see beyond the diagnosis, beyond the hospitalization, children and parents for who they are and how they're showing up is such a humane part of medicine, which I think you really bring as a child life specialist. Thank you. Honestly, it's those moments that keep me in the position and doing this. It's the getting to see a patient that I met the family when she was getting discharged from the NICU. and that she then brings in pictures of her quince dress that she's getting ready <laughs> to uh, have. And so it's those, it's those kind of moments. It's the, the James and Lindsay moments and find, you know, seeing him just blossom after transplant. It's all yeah. of those things that, that keep me doing this. Yeah. I am. I imagine. And what I hear from parents a lot is, sometimes the first time they meet a child life specialist, it's really hard to know like what they do and what they can offer, right? Because they may have had experiences in in the past where they're bringing in toys or blowing bubbles or um, something like that. So what's really unique about your position is that really um, purposeful time to get to meet the family and explain your role. How often are you visiting families during their transplant process? Um, it, or does it kind of just depend on what the needs are? I imagine I'm kind of answering the own question, my thought, but I would, I would love to hear how you decide um, throughout your day, who to visit, um, how you decide which interven- interventions to do and just walk us a little bit through that. As you said, it really depends and it really varies um, with our patients that are preparing for transplant, you know, once I meet them during the evaluation, I kind of keep a a list of them so I can see when they come back into the clinic again, uh, whether they're able to visit us again before transplant or not. I try to touch base. 
Then during the actual transplant hospitalization, um, we do multidisciplinary rounds every morning um, outside the patient's room with the surgical team, the renal team, allied health, we're all together. Um, So I kind of get an overview of how the patient is doing that day and what some needs might be. And so are able, I'm able then to plan kind of for the day Mm -hmm. of, are there any procedures or those kind of things going on? Um, Is the patient on isolation now and they're going to be stuck in their room? Okay, Mm -hmm. maybe we need to do something a little different or, you know, are they going to be on isolation long term? And we can advocate and have some wonderful transplant team members that are able to advocate further up to infectious disease of, okay, what measures do we need to take to get them out of their room? You know, right, without touching right. anything or anything else, but we need to get them out of those four walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The four walls get quite small. Yeah. So it's little things like that, just trying to kind of plan for the day and then what else the day holds elsewhere. It also yeah. depends on how much support the patient has to the family members are able to be bedside um, throughout the day, or we have families that, you know, are only able to stay for a short amount of time post-surgery and then they have to go back to work or other things. And so that kind of plays into it as well. Mm. One of my questions for you that I wrote to you was if you were to have a magic wand and you could do anything for your job or for the uh, kidney population or the families that you see, what would it be and why? So my first response, of course, is more allied health, whether it be child life, creative arts, social work, dietitian. I just think the allied health group altogether, of course, supports families so well. But I feel that's a little obvious. Um, So I also think of kind of another dream I've had amongst other team members is for our dialysis clinic as well as our outpatient and transplant clinic all to be under one roof, to be under one floor. Uh, At this time, we're in two different buildings because both groups are large and we are a large hospital. Um, But because of the cyclical nature of end-stage renal disease, as I mentioned before, these kids that have a transplant may not have it until they're an adult and may get more than one transplant. And in between may need to be on dialysis. Um, Those that are on dialysis may get a transplant and through other circumstances may only have it five to seven years or less, and then they're back on dialysis. And just to make that transition easier between um, all the modalities, I think would be amazing um, for families. So they get to know each other, they get to see each other, and the kids too, being able to see those on both ends of the spectrum as they're going through this journey. I can imagine the medical team would love that as well, (laughs) just for ease (laughs) of treating and seeing families. And um, yeah, sometimes that physical space can really be a barrier Um, when you have to transition literally from one place to another and have to have your mind do that too. And um, I imagine there's a lot of memories like, well, when we, the last time we were here was this was happening and now we're over here and it can be difficult. And for some of the patients, they've been on dialysis for several years and on hemodialysis and they know that team so well and they know the nursing staff and that then transitioning to transplant, um, some of them do feel a loss. And right. like, even though they're excited about getting a transplant and excited about having a new kidney, they feel that loss of community that they had within mm-hmm. the hemodialysis unit as well. Um, so being able to help that would be amazing. And we try yeah. to have things to um, encourage some of that continuity. Yeah. Well, it's it's that trauma-informed lens that you that you're really looking at community and safety for families is so important in providing that care. Yes. What other stories or experiences do you th- want to communicate to either families who are listening that um, have kiddos with chronic medical needs or child life specialists who are interested in supporting families with long chronic medical needs? What do you want them to know? I would say for families, um, you are the best advocate for your kiddos, no matter what their age is. Um, Continuing to encourage them to become 
um, a part of their medical team because it is their health. And especially as they grow, um, I always tell my, if I have students or others that, you know, my goal is for these patients not to need child life anymore because I want them to transition to adult care and be able to know how they cope best and be able to communicate those things. Um, So I feel like that for any family as well is going from that role of being the advocate and the driver to be the supporter Mm -hmm. um, and helping their kids get to that point. Um, So continuing to do that, continuing to encourage kids to be involved in events that are with the medical team in the hospital um, because some because some of our patients don't necessarily look different, don't necessarily seem too different. Sometimes they'll shy away, especially after transplant of, I've spent enough time at the hospital. I don't want to go to an event there. I yeah. I don't want to be different. Mm. But to be in a place where you aren't different, you're like everyone else there. Mm-hmm. So encouraging kids to go to camps, encouraging kids yeah. to go to the teen lock-in, to any kind of event that can be offered. Um, wow. Even those times they kind of resist. We tell yeah. some of our parents for some of the kids going to, to camp. We have a week-long kidney camp in the summer and they are a little resistant. We kind of tease of you drive up to the door, open the door and push, <laughs> we'll catch and we'll go from there. <laughs> Love it. And a lot of times that's all it takes because they go once and the next thing you know, they come back. When are we going again? When can we go again? Because they then realize they're not different. They're like everyone else that they're with. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. What a like common, you know, kind of tween or teen rite of passage that we all go through and just feeling so different than everyone and needing sometimes that push and the catch. I love the way you deliver that. (laughs) So true. Like there, there's support on both sides. We just got to get them over the bridge. Yes, definitely. And the second part of your question for child life specialists, um, not being afraid of a chronic illness, um, looking for the highlights in it. As I said, the my joy in it is watching these kids grow and um, watching them go on to do other things, watching, you know, hearing of them going to college, graduating from college and getting their first job, uh, those little moments and hanging on to those because like any position, there are the hard days and there are the rough times. Um, But hanging on to those, those highlights and having a good support team with you. We have a Mm -hmm. great allied health team that I know I can lean on my social workers, my other child life specialists I work with, my uh, quality of life coordinators and school coordinators, dietitians, all of them that we can lean on each other and vent and question and cry, any of those things. Mm, Well, thank you for um, sticking with what you have done for so long. I'm just laughing a little bit because you are so in a child life office right now. So we've got a hanger with the lays on the back of it. Mm -hmm. Like there's files and like, I just love it. I love a child life office. It is. It is crazy. And this is actually, the lays are actually on my social worker's desk. (laughs) That's amazing. So, but it is, it definitely is. I even tried to take a few files and things and stick them under my desk before this because it looked even crazier beforehand. Yes. (laughs) Well, do you all ever take interns or students or how involved are you um, with kind of the students who enter Texas Children's? Mm -hmm. We do uh, regularly take practicum students as well as interns. Um, We are a little different in that our service is service line based. So even though I'm a child life specialist, I am actually employed under the renal service. Um, Okay. And so it's a little different in that direction. Um, However, the child life department, as they accept intern students and practicum students, they reach out to us to be preceptors as well. And so um, we actually all take them. I love it. It's like kind of you have the best of both worlds. Like if you need to escape from the child life department for a little bit, you can come over here and vice versa. (laughs) It's so true. It's so funny. We actually have a... um, new child life specialist, our third team member. Um, And both my partner and I, my partner has been here 12, almost 13 years. Um, And we 
both said the exact same thing to her, yeah. <laughs> that we do have kind of the best of both worlds in being um, service line based. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll just, I'll finish with a, a question and that's when you meet a new family with a diagnosis or perhaps they're going to embark upon transplant or even post-transplant. What are some of the favorite resources that you recommend um, as a, a valued member of the care team that you really can rely on as a trusted resource for families when they're outside of the hospital? Um, one of my favorites is kidshealth.org. Um, I feel they have a lot of great kid-friendly explanations, so I definitely turn families towards that and steer them in that direction um, just because they have some great explanations. They have um, illustrations and things that really help kids understand what's going on. Right. Uh, a lot of the times for parents, um, I kind of turn them towards uh, the National Kidney Foundation, um, and they have a lot of great resources and information for families. There is even um, a group called kidneyschool.org uh, that has broken down into little modules that are wow. both for health care team members as well as families uh, to learn more about kidney disease and be able to educate themselves with good, honest knowledge. Oh, I love that. I saw you write that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to take a look at that because we do learn a lot these days online or webinars, our courses or whatever it may be. So the fact that you can go to kidney school, <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> neat. <laughs> well, um, do you have any other stories or experiences that you were hoping to share that I didn't ask you about? Goodness. Not that I can necessarily think of. I think most of my favorites, you you did yeah, ask. I got out of you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, um, like I said, just, I have another friend. Her name is Holly. She's been in the oncology unit at a children's hospital for probably close to 18 years too. Oh, and great. there are so many ups and downs that come with sticking with the same unit. But just hearing you speak, um, your level of knowledge that you get to add as a value for families, I'm sure is just, you're such a safe person. So thank you for doing what you do and for sharing it with us. Thank you so much. I love to talk about my kidney kids. So anytime <laughs> I can. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for listening to Child Life on Call. If you head to our website, childlifeoncall.com, you're going to find all sorts of stuff there for parents, professionals, healthcare providers, child life specialists, no matter who you are. Actually, when you just go to our homepage, it'll tell you, it'll help you direct to exactly where you need to go. On that, you'll find opportunities and PDUs for child life specialists, parents. We've got a starter kit for you and clinicians. We even have a clinician course, which teaches you how to be a confident and capable caregiver in pediatrics. We're so grateful that you're here. Please DM us on Instagram. And like I mentioned, when you rate and review this podcast, it helps other families be able to find us. So let's keep doing that. And I will see you again here next week.